Thank you, Chris. Well, it appears even church is not exempt from CrowdStrike, hence why we've had all the issues this morning, because OneDrive didn't like, didn't seem to work. But never mind, we've got it sorted now. I don't know about you, but when I sort of heard what was going on on Friday, it felt a bit Terminator-esque, and Judgment Day was here. The IT had all gone, it was going to come and take us, and then I thought, no, it's not. It's just a silly update that's caused the entire world to stop functioning completely. But hey, two weeks ago, we began our journey through two Thessalonians. Last week, we had Andrew here. Now, I had asked him to preach on, on some of this passage, and he'd missed the note and preached on something else, which was absolutely fine. But I think he said to me afterwards, well, I dodged a bullet there, Tim, because this is not an easy passage. When we read the start of 2 Thessalonians 2, I was thinking, why have we gone for 2 Thessalonians? How on earth am I going to preach on that? Anyway, here we are, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. David will conclude the series next week, looking at 2 Thessalonians 3, as uh, some of us are at New Wine. I joke about why did I choose this, but as I was preparing this week, it really felt once again that it is the Lord that is wanting us to explore this letter from Paul in this time, in this season, and particularly for the Church of England. Because there are so many things that are relevant in this chapter to where we find ourselves today as a church and in society. In 2 Thessalonians, what we see here is that it's more than the persecutors of the church who are challenging the Thessalonians, but it is the false teachers as well. It is not just the physical assault on the senses, but it is the intellectual assault on the senses. The great John Stott, he used to say, the intellectual assault on Christianity is often fiercer than the physical. The intellectual assault is often fiercer than the physical. I do wonder what his thoughts would be on the state of the church at the moment. Interestingly, though, John Stott would go on to say that both physical and intellectual challenges to the church can be beneficial because they act like the refining of precious metals in the fire. But they can both be painful and cause havoc. Friends, right now in the Church of England, we are in the middle of pain and havoc across the entire spectrum. We are feeling like everything is going wrong, that the church is going to implode. Or at least I am. I don't know about you. It feels that way. There is an intellectual assault on the church from all angles. And that's why I think this chapter feels so relevant to where we are today. We are in that refiner's fire. I think the Lord is trying to shake up the Church of England and say, come on, guys, you've got it wrong. Yes, we have got it wrong. The church has lost its sight on Jesus Christ, and it's about time we reclaim Jesus. I was not ordained into the Church of England. I was ordained into the Church of God. We are in the refiner's fire. It's not a nice place to be. But I think that God is teaching us things through this difficult period, and he is using it to refine his church, ready for whatever is coming next. Now, we're going to start with two quite bad news, shall we say, but the good news is there. The first point, and again, actually, this chapter splits really nicely into three sections, like 2 Thessalonians 1. I wonder if Paul was thinking, Anglican preachers, there's your three points given to you on a plate. Firstly, Paul warns against the error of the false teachers in verses 1 to 3. At the time that Paul is writing this letter to the church, the false teaching has made its way into Thessalonica. And it was all about the coming of Jesus and being gathered to him. Now, this features in 1 Thessalonians in chapters 4 and 5. And the Thessalonians were troubled that Jesus had not yet returned because some of them had died and it was like the day of the second coming had already happened. So that's what the false teachers were saying. So the Thessalonians were really concerned. They were troubled. That's not a new thing, though. Even in, if we trace church history back, there are so many people who have said, but the day of the Lord has come. Jesus is coming. He's coming at 10 o'clock on the 21st of July, 2024. Well, guess what? No, he's not. It's 20 past 11. 
One of the modern errors, though, the big ones, is the Jehovah's Witnesses, because they say that Jesus returned in October 1914, but invisibly. So Jesus' return is no longer something to look forward to because it's already taken place. Paul begs the church to not become easily unsettled or alarmed at what is happening. He begs the church. And the way the NIV translates unsettled, it is actually translating the phrase from the Greek, shaken from your mind. Do not lose your conviction. Do not compromise on your beliefs is essentially what Paul is telling the church. That is something we need to hear. Do not compromise. Do not move away from your conviction because of the ways of the world. It's very, very relevant. I think that this is something we have to be alert to in 2024. Because there are plenty of false teachers in the church. Just look at the prosperity gospel. It is wrong. It is not right. Preachers who are idolized, preachers who spend millions on private jets to get from here, there, and everywhere. The celebrity culture in the church is really, really bad. And then what happens? The celebrity person who you think is wonderful, dare I say, Mike Pilavachi. And look what happened there. There are so many teachings in the church that are just not right, that actually we have to make sure we do not become unsettled, that we keep our conviction and we keep our composure, no matter what the world will throw at us or the church. If we trace back through church history, that first split comes because the early Christians, I say the early, it was about um, about a thousand years after, I think about a thousand years after my church history has just gone out of my head. But it was a debate over an iota, which is the I in Greek. Is the spirit from God or is the spirit of God? And ever since then, we've had the Eastern and the Western church. And then it's fragmented further and further and further and further. So we have thousands of denominations now. Today, perhaps the split that everyone is talking about is over prayers of love and faith and the split of same sex uh, in the church of same sex blessings and marriage which teaching is correct what should we do about it only the lord knows the answer well, if we take away the subject it all comes down to how are we interpreting the bible both sides say they're right how are we interpreting what scripture says and that's why this is such a big issue take away the whole subject matter How are we interpreting our Bible? Paul is reminding us that people will get it wrong. He is reminding us that when people get it wrong, though, we don't judge them. He's reminding us that we don't start swaying to that way. But we have to hold on to the conviction that we have, that the Holy Spirit has given us, and we have to stand firm. That is what Paul is telling us here. In, t- in Thessalonica, so the false teachers had claimed Paul's authority for what they were saying. It's likely they, will have for- they may have forged a letter from Paul. And remember, this is a time before social media, before IT. This is a time when truth was taken as a given. It was an oral tradition. The teacher would be there. He would be speaking. Because it would be a he in those days. He would be speaking the words of Paul and people would believe it as the truth because that is how it was in those days. But nowadays, we seem to be in the completely opposite direction where truth is a movable feast. And actually, well, I think this is true, therefore it must be true. You think that's true, so you must be, that must be right. And we both just say, well, that's okay. We've both got our own version of the truth. We've moved so far away from the truth. But the truth, friends, is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says in John's Gospel. He doesn't say, I am, I'm going to use, I, this isn't my original. He doesn't say, I am the way, the compromise, and the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I think what John Stott is getting at when he says that the intellectual attack can be fiercer than the physical is because the intellectual attack is much easier to manipulate people. Paul reminds the church in Thessalonica that the coming of the Lord cannot have happened 
because there are two things that have to happen first. An event must take place and a person must appear. The event, which he says is the rebellion, and then the person, the man of lawlessness, the rebel. St. John writes of the expectation of his coming and reminds us that he will be in the world before appearing. When he is revealed, the rebellion will take place. So, friends, the safeguards to the false teachers and the rebellion is to hold on to the original teaching of the apostle. It is to hold on to scripture. He is reminding the church that they need to remember what Paul had taught them and know that he has not changed his mind. That is how they can tell. Is it from Paul or not? What they hear, does it fit with what Paul's been teaching them or does it sound a bit weird? And if it sounds a bit weird, it's not the truth. Again, John Stott, quoting him a lot today, he writes, loyalty to apostolic teaching is that's now permanently enshrined in the New Testament is still the test of truth and the shield against error. So when the world comes at us and says, the church needs to change, it's outdated, it's old-fashioned, your teaching is old-fashioned, well, no, it's not, because it's based on this book. It is based on the words of Jesus himself, which is the truth. He doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we're having debates about things, let's remember the way to tell if it's right or not is to look at Scripture. It's to say that just look at what Jesus himself has said. It is the word of God that is unchanging. When those debates happen, and inevitably they will, how do we check what's right? We look to Scripture. It's not rocket science. The figures show that churches that hold to the Bible are the ones that grow. Those that move away from the Bible are ones that die. Again, it's not rocket science, friends. We just hold on to Scripture, and guess what? Jesus will grow his church because we are being faithful. How easy is that? Out of breath now. That's the warning against the error of false teachers. Secondly, if we move on to verses 4 to 12, Paul teaches about the rebellion of Antichrist. He elaborates on some of the details of it. He talks about its leader, its outbreak, and its dynamics. He talks about the characteristics of the man of lawlessness. Opposition to the law and opposition to God. Jesus himself spoke about the increase of wickedness in the world, which would mean the love of most will grow cold. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that is how society feels at the moment. We've lost that idea of loving one another. There feels to be a lack of respect, a lack of love, a sense of entitlement for what I want to do, I will do, and I don't care who it hurts and upsets. What can I get out of this situation? Society is no longer working how it was intended to be, and we are facing a crisis in this day and age. Individuals are more isolated than ever before. People are more likely to be lonely. There isn't a sense of the community coming together to support one another. The last time that happened was in the pandemic, when the community spirit really gathered and we all said, isn't this great? Let's keep it going when we get out of the pandemic. And guess what happened? The pandemic ends and everybody goes back to their old ways. The community spirit left. Paul doesn't give us much more information about who this person of lawlessness is. But Dr. Leon Morris says that the passage is probably, the, this passage is probably the most obscure and difficult in the whole of the Pauline writings. And the many gaps in our knowledge have given rise to extravagant speculation. We only have to look through history to see some of those ideas about what Paul is referring to. Different people suggest different things about what Paul is saying. But we can't simply abandon the idea and go, actually, that's too difficult. We need to just ignore that little bit of Scripture. Because Paul penned it, and it is in Scripture, because it's written as instruction to the church. So it will happen. This man of lawlessness will appear, the person of lawlessness. The rebellion will happen. We know that. It's going to be hard. But the idea of opposition to God goes even further back, right back to the creation narrative in Genesis. Because what happens? Eve is tempted by the serpent to eat the fruit. 
that whole idea of opposition to God. One of my lectures at college, we ended up looking at the Babylonian creation myth. And it's, it's weird, but it's all about like, the different gods arguing with one another and basically rebelling against each other, which co- and then one of them creates the world. And it's, it's all weird, but it is just about that. Opposition to God. Indeed, we know that just after the apostles will probably, will probably have died, that Emperor Nero causes the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Opposition to God right there from the beginning. And that can be tracked throughout history that there is always going to be opposition to God until Jesus comes again. Now, Paul spends a lot of time talking about it. And actually, most commentaries have quite large sections about these few verses. And I've not time to go into it all now. You'll be relieved to hear. But in modern times, we can see the influences that creep into the church. We can see things such as secular humanism, extreme left and right wing ideologies. I suppose you could say this was society. The materialism of the consumer society that wants to put the items that we buy in place of God. It wants to replace God with an idol, usually money. The so-called theologies that infiltrate the church despite them being against scripture. And then there's also the social permissiveness permissiveness to things in society that God created. Things like human life, sex, marriage, family. All of the things that God created and instituted, there is a battle to uphold the traditional, proper, biblical teaching. Even in society, society has moved so far away. 20, 30, 40 years ago, it wouldn't dream of somebody living together. You'd go back through the marriage records. Even 20 years ago, most of the records show people with different addresses. And when Amanda and I got married, my training incumbent said, look at this, Tim, you're the first for a long time that's had different addresses when I wrote in the marriage register. And that's not, to, that's not to make anybody feel bad, just to state a, a, just a fact. I'm not saying this to make anybody feel bad. But there are modern day things that are under attack. So again, the warning for us, perhaps the reminder for us, is that we have to remain rooted in Scripture. We have to not get caught up in any of the things that will detract us from God. And it's getting harder and harder and harder in the 21st century to do that. Whether they're coming from outside or inside of the church, we have to hold on to the teaching of God and not get distracted. So that's Paul's teaching against the rebellion of Antichrist in a nutshell. Lastly, though, there is confidence in the stability of the gospel in verses 13 to 17. A lot of what I've said is pretty downbeat. It's hard to hear what's going to happen. It's all doom and gloom. One of the things I was taught at theological college is when you prepare a sermon, ask yourself the question, where is the good news? Well, guess what? The good news is in point three. There is confidence in the stability of the gospel. Despite all that is taking place in Thessalonica, Paul is confident that the church will withstand the attacks, intellectual or physical. Because the church is stable. Because it is built on the word of God. Stability is a coveted quality in life. We talk about a stabilized economy. We want a house that's stable, that doesn't slope or slant. We want to sit on a stable chair that's not going to fall over when we sit down. Even aircraft and ships have stabilizers to counteract the turbulence and the swell of the ocean. And the list goes on. We crave stability. The New Testament talks a lot about Christian stability. Paul declares in 1 Thessalonians 3.8 that now we really live because we are standing firm in the Lord. Or to put it another way, because we are stable in the Lord. He urges once again the church not to become unsettled. And in verse 15, he says, so brothers and sisters, stand firm. The New Testament identifies things which will affect our stability and the things that we need to take a stand on. Opposition or persecution, false teaching, temptation, all of these things is the enemy mounting an attack on the church and on the people of God. 
physically through persecution, intellectually through false teaching, and morally through the temptation to sin. It will get better, I promise. But that sounds like the position the church is in today. But what we have at the end of the chapter is a thanksgiving from Paul, an appeal, and finally the prayer. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 repeats the words from the start of the letter. We ought always to thank God for you. That should be reassuring to us. Because Paul is sensed that despite everything that will come, God has chosen them and called them by name and will bring them safely home. Paul doesn't feel any panic. He doesn't adopt any panic measures. And I think that's what the church needs to hear in 2024. That God has called each and every one of us into his service. God has a place for each and every one of us in this church. Even though we disagree on things, God has called each and every one of us. And he will call us home when the time comes. There is no panic. There is no fear. As long as we stand firm on the gospel, because that is the most stable thing in this world. That's not saying, it's okay, relax and take life easy. It's saying quite the opposite. Paul is telling the church to stand firm and to brace ourselves for the onslaught of the world. God's purposes will work out no matter what's going on. As long as we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, we will be okay. Paul doesn't mince his words here. He's very clear about what the Thessalonians need to hold on to and following that us. The teachings, which are the truth, which have been passed down through the ages. Those teachings which we call the Holy Bible. The apostolic traditions are the very foundation of Christian faith, and life? And is it important that we don't deviate from them? Ecclesiastical traditions within the church may be added on, and that's okay as long as they they follow the apostolic tradition of Christian faith and life, because they are the ones that we hold on to, because they are the teachings of Christ. For us, that means living and being biblical Christians, being uncompromisingly loyal to the teaching of Christ and his apostles. The only way we will resist the false teaching is to cling to the gospel. The only way we will remain stable in a turbulent world is to cling to the gospel. The entire section, this last section in chapter 2, the NIV heads up, stand firm. Because it shows us that Christian living is about stability. Stability that is found in our relationship with the Father. Stability that is found in the love of God. Stability that's found in the teachings of Jesus Christ. So the question for us, friends, then, is are we going to stand firm on the Word of God? Or are we going to be blown off course by culture and society and leave the Bible behind? Amen.